Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Podolan, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Podolan, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games but thought he was destined for 1,000. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hello there, and welcome back to the Up My Hockey podcast for episode number 51. Uh, this is an exciting time. We just finished 50 episodes. Uh, exciting time for me personally. That's a ton of episodes. I would never have dreamed I would have done 50. I mean, every episode is almost an hour and a half, if not more in length. Like we're talking about 75 hours plus of content from some amazing people in the industry, in the sport, uh, that have all provided amazing stories, uh, valuable lessons, right, of their journey uh, personal sometimes, otherwise from GMs and scouts, what they're looking for, how they look for it, uh, coaches, um, how to get the most out of players, how to create culture. Like there's so many amazing nuggets that I'm like ridiculously thankful and supremely grateful, uh, that we've gotten to this point. And I figured since the podcast has begun to pick up speed, obviously not all of the interviews have garnered the same attention. So, you know, some of the ones that were earlier on in the process, maybe people haven't had a chance to listen to, or, you know, I haven't listened to in a while and forgot some of the great lessons that are in there. So I thought that after 50 episodes, uh, or every 50 episodes, we should do a best of series. And I'm going to take five episodes at a time, uh, go in chronological order, uh, one through five in this case, and go revisit them. And it gives me a chance to go back and listen and to pick out some highlights that I can share with you. Uh, so in, in other words, like a highlight reel almost of these episodes. Uh, some points that I think would be nice to revisit. It gives me a chance to kind of offer a play-by-play on the clip itself, uh, get into my coaching hat and kind of what I do right now with teams and players uh, to help them become better athletes, better teammates, uh, you know, a better chance to realize all the things that they want to realize uh, as athletes. And, and yeah, so we're going to do that. We're going to go for five episodes. I'm going to grab a clip from episodes one through five. We're going to revisit them. I'm going to give you a little color commentary on them. And this is going to be a best of series. So I'm not sure if we'll do it, uh, you know, 10 episodes in a row. We'll, we'll definitely mix in other guests. We'll maybe have some bonus episodes on Thursday or something. But to start off with for episode 51, I thought we would release it on a Monday, uh, our regular podcast day, and then we'll go from there. So without further ado, we're going to start off with episode one, which was Kevin Peterson. Kevin Peterson was brave enough to answer my phone call and say, you know what, Pods, of course, I'd come over and I'd help you out with episode one. And what a great guy to have in because as the regional, Western Regional Scout for the Phoenix Coyotes, or the Arizona Coyotes now, uh, he's been through the game. He was been behind the bench as a coach at the junior level and at the minor uh, youth level with, with uh, some of the best athletes of their day and of their time. He was involved in the Brick Tournament, which is a feature tournament for first-year Adam age kids. And he was responsible for BCT, uh, the BC team for a long time. He was also responsible for the best ever program, the under-16s that he was picking. So he's been an evaluator for a long time. He's been around high-end talent. He's been behind the bench at the BC junior level. And now he's uh, scouting for the NHL, uh, the best 18-year-olds in the world. And there was so much from his episode uh, that we could grab. Uh, but I chose to grab one here to start off with just on how he got into the position that he's in now and how this is a lesson for everybody, whether you're a coach, whether you're a carpenter, whether you're a dentist, or whether you're a hockey player, on how to get to where you want to be. So let's listen to Kevin Peterson talk about how he got into the places that he is now. I think a lot of people are wondering, well, how do you, you know, I don't know anybody. Right. I don't know anybody. I want to get ahead. Whether you're a player that wants to get ahead and feels like, you know, they don't, they don't have those connections or the parents aren't wired in with the right people or there's people maybe want to scout or coach like you do. I was like, well, how do I do this? Do you have any advice there? Like for how do you, how do you start making these connections? How did you do it? You know what? Uh, my story is, my story is like a rags to riches to be fair. I, I used to just stick myself in the ring. I used to just like, you know, we talked about Burn Learning Club before that was, uh, you know, we're going back 10, 12 years that that place was 
the place in Vancouver to be. So if you were a young aspiring hockey coach, that's where you went, you know, now, now the landscape has changed with the academies and stuff, but my advice to people and the way I did it was I just went, I just stuck myself in the rink. If there was a practice, um, I would ask the coach, Hey, can I push pucks for you? And, and nine times out of 10, they would say no, because they didn't know me. You know, the Bantam A team was practicing, Hey, you know, can I push pucks? No. Okay. Well, that means I'll just watch. And if you're at 20 practices in a row watching and every time they look up and think like, who is this guy? And you keep asking, can I push pucks? Then finally they say yes. And that might lead to, you know, can I shadow you on the bench one game? Or I think honestly, the, like, it doesn't matter what you do. If, if you, if you, if you, if you have passion for what you're doing, then you'll find a way and, and the connections will be made. Um, I made mine naturally. I made mine just um, volunteering. I think volunteering is a lost art form. I do like, I think, and, and no disrespect to anybody listening, but I think the volunteer, um, you know, people aren't as willing to volunteer anymore than they were, you know, going back to when I was younger, when you were young, it's, it's now it's, you know, I want to get paid. I, I want, you know, compensation. I want this. I mean, the first four years I coached, I did it for free. Yeah. And, and I don't, I mean, putting myself in the people's shoes that hired me, they're thinking like, man, this guy works harder than anybody else. And he's not getting paid yeah. like that. That bumps you up a little bit. Right. Yeah. And every time I went to the rink, I wasn't getting paid. I was doing my own dime. And, and I felt like that was valuable for me. So, so advice for people is show commitment, but show passion for what you're doing. And don't always, I didn't try and jump 10 levels. I just, I did it slowly. And I remember going to a coach's conference and Pat Quinn saying, master the level you're at before you go to the next level. And I just always took that advice. Like I'm, I'm going to master this, this level. I'm going to make meet as many people as I can. I'm going to volunteer as much time, prove that I'm doing it for the right reasons. And then, Maybe I'll meet the next guy. So that's the way I did. (laughs) Such a cool perspective from Kevin. And I think, like I said, it is a lesson for all of us. And I know myself as a player for sure that I was trying to get somewhere else. And while I was trying to get somewhere else, I forgot about where I was. And him speaking about mastering the level you're at. I've heard other interviews, people talk about that. David Quinn talked about that recently. Uh, the head coach of the New York Rangers saying that how he moved on in the game, how he got the New York Rangers job was just to do the absolute best job he could do where he was at. Jared Bednar said the same thing, head coach of the head coach of the Colorado avalanche. Uh, Other players have said this, that, you know what, when you just focus on you being the best you can be where you are, being the greatest asset you can be to the team that you are at right now in whatever capacity that can be, serve the crap out of where you are, that's going to allow you to move on and get to that next level. So when we focus our perspective on where we want to be instead of where we're at, sometimes that can get us in trouble. Kevin talked about being patient too, right? Volunteering, putting yourself in the right environment, letting people know where your passion is. Follow your passion, good things happen. Be patient with your passion and good things happen as well. Um, I'm going to go revisit Kevin Peterson for one more um, clip here uh, because I'd be, you know, I'd be foolish not to because he talks about character and character is something that I've built a course around for hockey players. I beat the drum that's, that I say that character is a skill. Some people don't believe what I believe, but I believe that it is a skill. I don't believe it's either a thing you have or you don't have. I think that we can work on this thing called character and I think we can develop it. And if you're a youth hockey player right now listening to this, this is something that is of the utmost importance that we can improve our character. And Kevin Peterson talks about how important character is when he's trying to make decisions on players. He's trying to make decisions on who he wants to bring in to the Arizona Coyotes organization. He is obviously not alone with this. Coaches love character, GMs love character, scouts love character. They're trying to find it. And he's going to talk about how important it is to the Arizona Coyotes. Listen up. And I have to do it. It's part of my job. I have to, you know, at the NHL level, we're investing potentially millions of dollars on you as a person. Um, You know, if there's any doubt in our minds, again, I'm speaking generally, I have to believe that all 31 teams act the same. If there's any doubt in any of our minds that you're going to, you know, represent the organization negatively, doesn't matter junior hockey or whatever, um, that's enough for us to lose interest. 
And I think, um, you know, kids have to understand that it's easier said than done. You know, when you're growing up and your dad tells you or your mom says, you know, watch because people are always watching. Watch what you say, watch what you do, watch watch who you say, you know, about or watch who you talk to or watch how you talk to somebody. And it's so true because one one mistake could could hurt you for the rest of your life. You know, if, if you're, um, you know, if, if you do something negatively, you know, three, four years ago, you know, um, you talked about body language during the game. Um, there could be situations off the ice, you know, skipping curfew at your billet's house or, you know, um, I don't want to say alcohol and drugs because that's an extreme, but there is things like that. And you can never, re- it's tough to recover from that. And what you said about picking up the phone, that that's just doing your job. Like, um, you know, it's, it's easy for me to go in a rink and find the best player. That's not hard. Anybody can be a scout if we're trying to find Connor McDavid. Yeah. We know who he is. Yeah. My sister can tell me who Connor McDavid is. Yeah. But there is players that make the NHL by having the right character. And that that's our job to really, really dig and find those people. And like you said, you, you do have to make phone calls. You do have to do your research. You have to do your homework. And, um, you know, any, any good person that you've been around, you have no problem when somebody calls you to tell that person how great the other person is. And if you've been around negative people or people that you don't like, when somebody calls you, you have no problem telling everything, you know, that, you know, he did this, he did this, he did this. You're not a whistleblower. You're not ratting him out. You're just telling the truth. And um, I think from my sitting in this chair, knowing my job, I have to do that homework because I can't present a player to my boss and say, yeah, but, you know, he did this and also he did this. And by the way, his teammates, you know, said he does this. So that that's probably not going to fly. All right. So that interview with Kevin was really quite fantastic and really set the tone, I think, for the podcast and what the podcast was all about. Uh, that conversation covered a ton of things, uh, all valuable lessons, and definitely an episode that you want to listen to if you haven't listened to it. Uh, so many nuggets in there. Uh, moving on to episode two, though, I went to Kevin Sawyer. Kevin Sawyer is an old teammate of mine from back in the Spokane Chief days, and he went on to an NHL career as an enforcer and also as a character player. And his story in and of itself, just to listen to Kevin's story, is so inspiring. To think that he was a 17-year-old kid trying to play junior A, and he couldn't find a team to play on. He got essentially cut from three different teams. He had, his, he had one suitcase and his old beat-up car, and he would just drive from place to place. The team would pick him up, and then they'd healthy scratch him, and then they'd cut him, and they'd have to drive somewhere else. And to think that two years later, or three years later, that from that existence, he was in an NHL jersey playing NHL games is phenomenal. Uh, Kevin learned how to play the game. He learned how to play his position. He learned what it took to be a leader. And, uh, and now he's doing color commentary or color, being a color broadcaster for the Winnipeg Jets. And he was one of the best guys you'll ever meet. He's so authentic. He's so down to earth. And this interview was super fun for me. Like lots of laughs, lots of good stories. Kevin's a great storyteller. And one of the stories that he tells here, which we're going to get back to, is a story about Mike Babcock. So Kevin and I had the opportunity to play under Mike in Spokane. Kevin also played under Mike in the minors in the AHL and also played under Mike in the NHL with the Anaheim Ducks. So Kevin saw... Uh, the evolution of Mike Babcock and, you know, as Kevin was experiencing his own evolution to figure out how to play the pro game and to get to the NHL. And this is a really interesting story about Mike, which I think you'll find entertaining. Uh, Like him or hate him, uh, Mike Babcock uh, is a good coach. Uh, He is a great coach in many circles. And, uh, and yeah, and this story talks a little bit about how Mike approached the game, how he approached his players and how he approached himself. And, uh, I like to check it out. I think you'll get a laugh out of this one. I want to talk a, a bit about uh, Babs because we ended up um, we ended up having Mike Babcock together in uh, in Spokane as well. And at the time, we didn't know he was going to be Mike Babcock because everybody knows him now. Um, he had just come out of University of Lethbridge. He was a young guy. Had a bit of a chip on his shoulder. Um, I remember him being just super well prepared. I remember him being uh, really intense. I remember him being very strategic and then looking back, I mean, 
again, having all the coaches I did have, he was, he was definitely one of the best packages at, at the time. You know, I mean, even though he, he was young. Um, and I, I think, I mean, he had a big impact on you then and later on too, correct? Like that was, that was another guy that you seemed to bond real well with. Yeah, totally true where I kind of had my, like kind of taking that evolution of who I was as a player into now adding some leadership um, into that, um, into my 20 year old year, which was when Mike came to Spokane. And, you know, the reality was, is, is, you know, I wasn't a very good player, uh, but they created a role for me and they started to help me identify who I was going to be if I wanted to have a chance. So um, just like you said, I mean, teaches you so much about how to do the right thing, how to think the game. I rem what I remember about Babs is how he can take something complex and simplify it into something that you can actually apply right away. Um, so his communication skills. But I would the th when I think of Mike back in the junior days, and I played for him in the American League and, and the NHL, but I, re I think about learning how to take a bit more role on as a leader. Yeah, no, I love that. And I actually, I mean, because I think coaching is such an interesting element and in, in, in something that I do is something that you were involved in with the Chiefs as well. So I love I love asking questions about that because really like now he's going to be regarded as one of the best of his era, if, if not the best, you know, like there's there's definitely an argument there. What hasn't he won? He's been successful everywhere he's gone. Um, and you saw that evolution from, uh, you know, and yourself grew as a player as well, but you saw the evolution of him as a coach, like from from junior to the minors and then to the NHL. Um, did you did you see a, a, a change in him? Like how, how did you, how did Mike evolve in, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I did, but very, you are who you are. And then you, you try to improve on your weaknesses and, and then of course bring your strengths to the surface as much as you can. And the reason I say that is, is like I, I have a lot of friends that either coach with Mike, played with Mike you know, in the 90s or up to even to t today. And, you know, everybody has strengths and weaknesses and he's certainly evolved. One of the things about Mike that I remember is how uh, engaged he was daily with his leadership group and how hard he can be on his group or even people around him. Now that's because of the fact that he wants to be better every day and that's to me what makes him so great. But it's... It's difficult. So here's one story, and, and I think this is this is in no way meant to be disrespectful, but in the American Hockey League, we won our first seven games uh, under Babs as a, as a new coach in the American Hockey League. And leadership coffee in the morning, and our group would be in and out of his office, and everything was great, and we went on to lose three in a row. Well, after the third one, I mean, it was brutal. Like, I remember, like, just short, and grumpy, and oh, God, it was terrible. And I was in the cold tub one day, and I could be accused of being <coughs> sensitive sometimes, but Babs comes up to me and he says, we're having an effing meeting, get out of the tub and into my office and just pissed me off. Yeah. We had our, our meeting and that night I started a line brawl because <laughs> the, guy, the guy that I started with, I owed him from the year before. Right. <laughs> so after the game, I went up to Babs and I'm like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? And he says, if you think I'm upset about that, that's exactly what we needed. And I said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is every time I was driving that guy in the face, the only person I could think about was you. <laughs> <laughs> the reason I say that is because he was awesome and he taught me something in that because he got backed off and I wasn't trying to be disrespectful, but it, it was honest. Yeah. He's honest. And he called me that night at like one in the morning. He goes, okay, this is what I've come up with. We're talking about this tomorrow. Are you okay with that? Yeah. We went to the rink and we had a team meeting about it. And he got better from it. I love that story with Mike so much, you know, there, there's so much to that, right? On so many levels, on an individual level, on a team level uh, that we can learn from. Plus there's some humor in there. And that's a great interview if you want to check out uh, Kevin and what he has to say. Uh, the next one we're going to get to here is episode three, which was Danny Briere. Now, Danny Briere, what a quality, quality human this guy is. He's been a He's just been a great supporter of mine. He, he's, he's answered the phone when I've called. Uh, we played against each other. You know, we, we had an experience with each other at World Junior Camp. Uh, we played against each other a little bit, and we were, at a, we were at an NHL alumni event together where we were at a speaking conference, essentially what it is, to learn how to present, uh, to be a better speaker publicly. And so there was uh, him and I were there and we hit it off and, and we've stayed in contact ever since. And he was nice enough to come on. Now, Danny, for those of you guys who don't know, please look him up. Uh, this guy, 
was a first rounder to Phoenix. He had over 150 points, I think, uh, in junior. He ended up winning a gold medal for Canada at the World Juniors. Uh, he he was a huge, prolific scorer at the minor league level, but he had a really, really hard time breaking into the NHL. He was an undersized guy. I think he said he was five foot eight and three quarters. And uh, at, a, at a time in the 90s, right, when the league was huge and guys were big and you're allowed to hold and you're allowed to hack and slash and hook. And, uh, and Danny was a really good offensive player, really creative, really dynamic. But he had a hard time figuring out how to get to the NHL. And he is so vulnerable in this interview. Like this interview is a how to become a hockey player off the ice. Because that is what Danny had to do to get to the next level. And I want to share with you where he gets into it, just a portion of it. Um, he gets into all the steps that he took to become a player who could end up being a top 10 scorer in the NHL. And who ended up being a guy who went to the Stanley Cup Finals twice and was inches away from winning his Conn Smythe Trophy the one year. So check out Danny's comments here. This is my how to become a hockey player clip. Um, you told me that story about the sports psychologist that, that you met uh, or were introduced to at least. And, and I really think that's an interesting story, even the way he approached you and then some of the stuff that he, he helped you with. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, maybe maybe share, share that about how that introduction was made and, and that first sort of 48 hours um, uh, of, of that after that introduction. Yeah, so that, that, was, that was very interesting. Um, you know, like I said earlier, in juniors, Early in the minors, things went really smoothly on the ice for me. But when I, every time I would get to the NHL, I just could not be the player, the same player. I could not, you know, produce at the same level. Um, <coughs> sorry, that I was, you know, when I played uh, in the AHL or in juniors. So that was very frustrating. Um, uh, the owner of the Phoenix Coyotes at the time, Mr. Berg, approached me one day and he said, um, Danny, I have a friend of mine who's a uh, sports psychologist and uh, I would really like you to spend um, spend time with him and go see him in, in his office. And I was like, sure, like at this point, I'm willing to try anything. And uh, I went in uh, to Gary Mack's office and uh, we started talking <coughs> And Gary asked me to describe myself, how things were going, and uh, what what was you know holding me back. You know, and I started uh, kind of going around the room, blaming everybody else, from my teammates to my coaches to the referees to anybody that I could point the finger. <laughs> and uh, he kind of let me talk. And um, after about half an hour, he stopped me and and he said he said, "All right, we're we're pretty much done here, uh, but all you've done is complain about the people around you." Um, he says, I want you to go home and, and think about that and, and start looking at yourself. Um, he says, I, I think part of the problem is you. You're, you're looking elsewhere, but you're the problem maybe. And um, he says, I want you to go home and uh, call me back when you're, you're ready to, uh, to, to take our, our next meeting. And I remember driving home and at night, uh, that night, you know, in bed, thinking how wrong he was and how clueless he was. Uh, he hadn't listened to anything I was telling him. Everybody, everyone, it was everybody else's fault around him. Right. Um, you know, and I slept on it. And uh, a couple of days later, I started, because you know, I couldn't get it out of my head. And I, I kept thinking about it. And, and finally, kind of came, came to grips that, you know what, maybe he was right. Maybe there was something there. So uh, about two and a half days later, I finally grabbed the phone and uh, called him back and said I, I was ready to, uh, to take the next step and go back in the office and learn a little bit more about what he had told me. Right. And from that point on, it changed everything. Um, uh, the way I saw things, um, the way I was, uh, well, it basically changed my career uh, from that point on because I went back and um, made me realize that, you know, and it's so obvious, but when you're in it, you don't realize um, that you can only control what you can control. You can't control what the coach thinks and what line he's going to play you on. You can't control the players you're going to play with. You can't control what calls the referees are going to make. Um, but I spent so much energies, you know, just looking to blame something else um, and find excuses. Um, and from that point on, he, you know, it made me concentrate on myself. Worry about what you can worry. Change what you can change when it's time. Um, you know, so that was one of the, of the example. Um, he also mm -hmm. me and and um, 
we became to a routine where when I would walk into a dressing room, I would leave all my problems away from the rink in my locker room. So as soon as I would take my street clothes off, um, that would go in the locker room and that would stay there. And then I became Danny Briere, the hockey player, the warrior that would go on the ice and play and forget about all the other problems. Um, so that's something that I had to, to work on every day coming to the rink. And at first it was tough, you know, I'd forget sometimes. Um, but you, I came to a point where it, it was just, it just happened. Um, mm -hmm. After 25, I was 30, I was 35 years old. I was still doing that. Um, it just became part of my routine on, on a daily basis. Um, early in my career, when I wasn't playing a lot, uh, he, he taught me um, how to take some mental shifts. So if you're sitting on the bench and you're not playing, so you don't lose the feel of the game, you take someone on your team and you just follow them. Follow them with your eyes and pretend you're that, that player. So for me, Jeremy Roenick was uh, my example on, on a lot of nights when, uh, you know, in the second half of the game, if I wasn't being used as much to not lose the feel in case they needed me late in the game, well, I would follow and take mental shifts with you. Uh, that yeah me a lot um, another thing is everybody's different as far as um, how intense they need to be so obviously a guy who's out there has to to hit a lot and fight um, he needs to be um, on a scale of one to ten uh, his energy level needs to be at ten every time he hits the ice just going to take a quick break from this clip with Danny Briere to remind you that now is a perfect time to work with me. If this is something you've been thinking about, either as a, you know, a private uh, consultation or as a, one of my private clients or as a team, I'm really focusing on teams right now with massive success. Uh, if, you're, if you're on a team, uh, talk to your manager. If you're a coach, uh, DM me. I come in and we can talk about character. We talk about character traits. We talk about how to build character as a skill. We can talk about mindset. I really like to focus on the things players can control and really treat them as skills and give them the ability to take steps forward and to empower them to move the needle on some of these intangible traits that are going to help them as players and obviously shh, help them as people. But they don't want to hear about the help as people. They want to hear how they can become the best hockey players that they can be. And we've been really knocking it out of the park with, uh, with the team stuff. So if this is something that is of interest to you, you want to teach your team or your player you know, how to become more professional, how to take preparation seriously, how to think about character as a, as a skill, something that they can promote within themselves, how to create new standards for themselves, how to become more mentally tough, how to, how to increase their mindset and their self-awareness skills their self-assessment skills, all these things that are super valuable to players and to people, um, by all means, hook me up, um, reach out to me, and we'll make something happen. Uh, I'm getting fired up about this. Seeing the results on these teams and in these players makes me want to get out there and, and make myself more available. So take me up on it. Like I said, come find me. Now is the perfect time. Even if you're not on the ice, now is the perfect time because it gives these players something to focus on something that they can feel good about and start building their self-belief and their self-esteem again. So uh, I'll bring you back to the episode now, but just remember upmyhockey.com is where to find me. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram or you also can find me on Facebook. Uh, any place there, uh, reach out and we'll make something happen. Cheers. Um, in a player like myself, or if I use, let's say, a goalie. Well, a goalie cannot be a 10. He needs to be relaxed. He needs to be in control. He probably wants to be uh, at a 3, 2, 3, 4 level uh, on that scale. Mm -hmm. so, um, you know, we figured that the best level for me is I need to be intense, but also in control. So if I got the puck, uh, I didn't want to be one of those guys that would just slap it around and get rid of it. I needed to control the puck, make plays. So I needed to slow it down. So we figured that seven or eight on uh, my energy level, uh, that's where I needed to be. So it's managing that, controlling that. Um, and also when, when you're a young player, um, and, and I'm, I, I was the same, I thought, okay, I'm going into a game and the coach wants me to back check hard. He wants me to be the best on the face off. He wants me to check and be the defensive player. I also I can't lose the third man. <laughs> I can't turn the puck over. Blue line is ex extremely important. I get in the offensive zone. Now I got to fight through my checks. Um, I, you know, I can't 
if there's two guys low, I can't go and jump in. I got to stay high as well. I can't pass up an opportunity. Every time I'm in this area, I have to shoot. So now I had like 15 things that I was going into a game thinking about, okay, I, I can't forget this. I can't forget that. And I, w I was overwhelmed. Um, with, with Gary, we came every game. It was different points, but we would have two, three points max. So every time I let into a game, he said, you know what you need to do. Now focus on two, three things maximum. So let's say I want to be the fastest skater when I'm out there and I got to check well. So that's it. That's all I worried about. In between shifts, I come back to the bench. You let go of the negatives. You refocus. What are your two key points for tonight? Okay, I got to skate hard. I got to be the fastest and I got to check well. And then that's, right. it keeps Because the brain, the brain can't handle it all, right? I mean, and that's the – that's the – it's one thing I talk about again and again and again. One is like, first of all, to find that preparation that works for you. Like you said, like there's different guys going to prepare differently, but there is, there is a mechanism to, for high performance that's going to work for you. Right. And there is a way to get that done. And, and once you have that, uh, once you have that toolkit right now, you're able to go perform, right. You're not, it, it's not just figure it out. Right. And I, I think that's the way you and I, that's where we were brought up. Like we went to junior, we watched these guys that would eat, eat pasta before the game. Then everyone would have a nap and then you show up at the rink and, and you'd yeah. play. There was yeah. no process, right? There was no like, Hey, how are we going to do this? And if you want to do it at a top level, you want to be elite. There is a process. There's correct? a process and there's a plan. And yeah. that's what I realized working with, with Gary Mack and um, it completely changed my career. Those are just examples of, of things. And, and, you know, I could rattle off another five or six uh, quickly like this, but those, those were part of the plan that, that helped me become um, a better player, better prepared. Um, you know, and, and I, I would get on the ice after that and I looked across and, and I, I would see, uh, you know, a, a guy like yourself who's twice my size, but in my mind, I was better prepared. I was better equipped and I was m mentally stronger than the guy that I was facing. So I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried that the guy was, yeah. um, you know, that confidence was, was a, a, a huge part of my turnaround, even though it, it took a while. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but yeah. And I well, was that's the word Danny right there. I don't want to cut you off, but that word confidence, we've only used it a couple of times, but like, I think it's so important just to point that out and then shine a light on it because a lot of people think about confidence in the idea that, you know, once I've scored 20 goals in the NHL, I've gotten the results. Now I have confidence to be in the NHL, right? But that, that's, that might not happen, right? You might not get an opportunity to get those 20 goals. You have to somehow figure out a way to have confidence before you get the 20 goals, right? And I think you just pointed out right there, like now you feel like you have this advantage. You're preparing, you got this edge. Now you have this inner confidence that allows you to probably go be the player you wanted to be. Was that a big, was that a big turning point for you, that aspect? That was, that was huge. That was, that, that was, that probably like in my development, one of the most important part of my development, and it wasn't even on the ice, it was off the ice. Um, like you mentioned earlier, like we're, you know, from such an early, uh, early age, we just go and we developed our, our skills on the ice. Um, but what was holding me back was, was off the ice, how to deal with things, how to prepare, how to have a plan to be, to be the best and, and feel like you're the best, you, you know, mentioned right inside you know you have to have that confidence even before you do certain things before you score 20 goals or 30 goals or 40 goals it's the you got to find it somewhere um and, and you know when you have a plan and, and you know how to attack it um it makes it a lot easier yeah no and i think um i don't know it's just it, it's such a it's, it's a crazy part of the game that, that you know, get you, guys like yourself can speak to it after they've been there um the guys are coming up nobody's talking about it like there's not and the coaches can't do it either right because it's not a thing that a coach can do it's not a thing that an assistant coach can do I, I don't know where it gets implanted to be honest like in the process of becoming a hockey player like where does somebody go to learn that preparation that professionalism that aspect of the game I'm not sure I don't even think it exists um, but it is such a, a, a crazy crucial part. So unless you're motivated as a player, I mean, now there is resources, right? YouTube, you can read books, you can do this, you can do that. Like you can, you can seek it out. But as far yeah. as like the natural arc of a hockey player, it, it doesn't get talked about. It's crazy. Not enough. That's for sure. And yeah. teams have started now having sports psychologists, but, um, I, I think it's more than that. It's, it's almost, it's like a, it's a mental coach that can really help you with, with all aspects, not, not just the, 
not just the issues uh, that you're facing when you play. There's issues off the ice. There's issues, like I mentioned, with, with preparation, with confidence. Um, yeah. a, a mental coaches, I, I think, uh, is something that you're going to see more and more eventually. Yeah, I think that's kind of the next frontier, too. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you found that. I was, I mean, just from my own personal side, I never I never did. I mean, I had, I had my first... Well, my, my real chance was I got 20 years old, right? I, I had a really good uh, uh, rookie year in the AHL as well, over a point a game. Like, that's the other you mentioned already. That's a tough league. That's a tough league. It doesn't get as much credit as it is. And as a 20-year-old, to go in there and put up, you know, over a point a game, that's you're doing well. That's impressive. Oh, yeah. But to go then to that next level and to walk into a room and to shake hands with Matt Sundin and Wendell Clark and, and you know, Curtis Joseph and to be roommates with Ty Domi and, I mean, all yeah. this stuff. And it's like – to, to feel like you belong on that ice, not only with them as line mates, but then to feel like you belong on the ice facing off against Lemieux and Gretzky and these guys that you have hockey cards of and posters in your room. Like it's a, it's a whole nother level. And like that, whether you call it confidence, whether you f- call it comfort, whether you call, I don't know what the right word is, but there is stuff that could be done to get ready for that moment, that experience. And, and I wasn't right. And I'm, I'm glad that you had the opportunity there through the years with Phoenix that they gave you the opportunity to, to kind of find your way there and, and uh, you know, look at the 700 games show for it. Right. And, and the thing, the thing is you don't know if you're ever going to get another chance, you know, right. one chance might be your only chance. You, you don't know. And you have to be prepared. I, I was fortunate because um, you know, I, I, I had, probably three or four chances uh, before it, it clicked. Um, but, but you don't know. I, I could have been, you know, just one chance and out. Um, yeah. that's, that's why you want players to be ready to go when, when that one chance uh, or that first chance arrives because you don't know if you'll get another one. I consider that a must listen, really. Uh, any athletes out there, any hockey players, any aspiring young players who are trying to figure out how to become consciously competent, as I call it, When I'm working with my players and teams, that's essentially what it is that we're doing. We're trying to figure out to be conscious about how to be great. So we don't just show up and throw on our skates and hope things go well, but we actually have a plan and we figure out what we need to do to arrive at the arena or at practice and be the best player that we can be. Danny had to figure that out. Danny had to be brutally honest with himself and with the help of somebody else to figure that out, to create a preparation routine that would serve him on the ice so he could create a routine when he wasn't playing at the NHL level, when he was sitting on the bench to be able to perform when he had the opportunity. There are so many gold nuggets in there and there's not one way to do it, of course, right? This is Danny's way to do it, but it's something that you can try. If something you hear there rings a bell for you and you're like, yeah, I would like to try that, do it right? There's so many ways to be prepared to earn your confidence, to earn the right to arrive on that ice and feel like you belong and that feel that you can excel. But find yours. Become a consciously competent athlete. That's what I do. That's what this podcast is about. That's what I'm encouraging you to figure out if you're listening there, if you're a coach, is to help your athletes become consciously competent. So awesome stuff from Danny. That interview is so great. I, it's a must listen. I'm telling you, you have to listen to that. It's everything up my hockey is about. Um, and Danny's story is, is super, super cool. Episode four now, we are getting into Brad Larson. Brad Larson um, was a guy that I grew up with that we played on the same Pee Wee team together. We go back to the Pee Wee days and we ended up winning a provincial championship together at the AAA level, the highest level at, in BC at the time from a town called Vernon that had like 30,000 people in it. So that's something that I still hold near and dear to my heart. I, uh, I remember that year very, very vividly. Uh, and three of us from that team, a little small team in Vernon, went on to play in the NHL. It was myself, Brad Larson, and Matt Higgins. Uh, many other players went on to play junior from that team. We had a really good group. Uh, of, of players and some fond memories and Brad now went on to go coach and now he's assistant coach with the Columbus Blue Jackets and he talks about his time here I, again a phenomenal interview Brad's a no all business serious kind of guy I'll tell you like it is uh, he doesn't pull any punches uh, that's what his players love about him that's what I love about him when you're talking about it, to him you're going to get a straight answer and he was a guy that made his way in the NHL by digging in and getting every ounce of his potential 
by working hard, by being a character guy in their room, by doing what other people wouldn't. And, uh, and he speaks about that. He says, I have no regrets. I got every ounce out of my talent. And what a great thing to be able to say that you got every ounce out of your talent. And uh, Brad here talks about accountability and leadership and how these are two valuable things. So listen up. And uh, another interview that I highly, highly suggest you, you take a listen to. Here's Brad Larson. Well, I can only go from personal experience, but certainly being subjected to to an environment of winning and, and that being really the true only standard uh, when you're there, it, 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 it fosters that, that, that selflessness in, in, in an environment where it's not about you. It's not about one guy on this team. And, and so the more you're fortunate to be in that environment and see it and feel it, and really it's feeling and going through it, you know, it, um, you know, I say this coaching all the time, there's no substitute for experience. Like you just have to go through things and good or bad. And, and, you know, uh, like, like most time you learn the most in failure, but again, at some point you have to learn and you got to take the next step and grow from it. And sometimes you need someone to teach you that and what that growth looks like. Uh, we went through it here and, you know, this is my 10th year in the organization in Columbus. And so I've been through a whole, I was in the minors for four years as assistant and head coach. This is my sixth year here now. And since John Tortorella has been here, you know, watching like the standard and, and, you know, everybody talks about culture and everybody talks about accountability and, and, you know, everybody loves accountability until it's them. You know, that's, that's kind of what, how it is. It's, but to watch him come in and, and, and really make some tough decisions and, and, you know, the standard for our team and what that looks like. Uh, there's no wiggle room. This is how, these are our values. This is what we stand with. This is how we work. And whether you're the top scorer or the guys on the fourth line, it doesn't matter. This is, you know, we all know that there's, there's different rope for different guys as far as skill set. You know, that's, you, you have to do that as coach. That's your responsibility. But once you've implemented values and standards for your group and, and, you know, works non-negotiable, that's just, that's what we are. That's who we are. That's our identity. Um, that's when you start to see some growth, I think, in your organization. They take the step. And, and that's the same with players. Like once you – self-assessment, self-accountability, um, you know, everyone says look in the mirror, and, 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 and that's a hard thing to do. A lot of guys don't really want the real answer. You know, they, they – I, I say a lot – players interview well. They say all the right things. But when we talk about leadership and, and the best leaders to me – with it, if you didn't say a word to me, I'm going to know basically what you're all about because your actions are going to be speak way louder than your words. It, you can say all the right things, but if, if your actions don't match up, you know, you're phony, really, right? Wow. So, but if you didn't say a word to me and I'm watching your, your, your habits in the gym, I'm watching how you prep for a game, I'm watching you in a, in, in a game when things get tough and, and, and you're backing up your teammate, you're encouraging your teammates when, uh, when things, kind of go they're going bad you know how do you handle yourself in that situation there's no analytics for that and everybody wants to put a number on things and that's why as coaches we're, we're always fighting these analytics people because of it because there's all these intangibles that are happening behind the scenes and you go no this guy he's important yeah he's he might be a 30 point guy he's not a 60 point guy but what he brings to my room what he does for my young guys what he does for our team and, and our message you can't put a value on that and and so leadership really is, it's going to be like most things in life. It's going to be, it's going to be your actions and how you're doing it and how you're carrying yourself um, without you having to say one word. And then I think that's, that's one of the most important takeaways I took from Colorado is just their actions and their words, they matched up. They were, it was like a puzzle that fit perfectly. I love that clip so much. That whole interview is just awesome. And, and hearing Brad talk about his time there with the Colorado Avalanche on that star studded team and then how he carried that on, uh, what he learned from that experience and how he brought that into Columbus and what he learned from torts and, and the type of culture that they're trying to create there and what really accountability means and what leadership means. Like I, I just, I think that's so valuable for young athletes out there, any athlete for that matter, not even young, any athlete, current NHL players still don't get this. Like how coaches want people in their room that exude this level of character that makes everyone else better that's beyond analytics and when your actions line up with who you are now you got something he said right you don't have to say a word to me because everyone knows what to say just not everyone knows what to do 
So once we focus more on our actions and the players that do focus more on their actions and what it takes for them to be the best player they can be, to be the most f- helpful and serviceable player to their team, now you got something. Right, So Brad is watching for those players. And even at the highest level of the NHL, there's some guys that get it and there's some guys that don't. And again, if we're talking about trying to be a consciously competent player, how am I going to give myself the greatest opportunity? How am I going to be the best player I can be and give myself the longest chance possible in this great sport of hockey? Learning how to be accountable, learning how to be a great leader, and learning how to have your actions line up uh, with who you are. Uh, is pretty, pretty special. So thank you for Brad for, be, for doing there. Anytime you can hear from an NHL coach, that's pretty wild. And uh, in our last clip here for episode five, we're speaking with another coach and another 600-game NHL player in his own right, and that is Trevor Latowski. Trevor Latowski uh, ended up playing all over the place, played with Carolina. He has some great stories about Rod Brindamore when he talks about that. But on his own personal journey, this is a clip that I took where He ended up in the minors, in the AHL, after playing on a world junior team, a Canadian world junior team, after having a great camp and thinking that he was super close to being an NHL player. And he talks about his story as first-year professional and what he went through, what he went through that year, what he had to fight through to end up being an NHL player. And I think this is a really important lesson for all of us. So let's hear what Trevor Latowski has to say about his rookie year in the AHL. Yeah, Yeah, it's probably the hardest year I ever had as a player that year because just to backpedal a little bit, the year before was almost the best year I ever had in hockey. My numbers were like through the roof uh, in junior. I won the gold medal on the world junior team, which the biggest thing for that tournament as an individual, it truly put me on the map as being a legitimate prospect for the Coyotes because I was, you know, on the world. I mean, I was one of the top players in the country. It was so that was a huge stepping stone for me. So I was feeling really confident about my game. It wasn't my first training camp because my first training camp had been the year prior, a real eye-opening moment of how far I was away. I felt I got a lot better in my last year of junior. I thought I was really close to being an NHL player. And then all of a sudden that happened. You go into the American League and that's a great league, you know, and I think the league has continued to get, it's so good now. It's so close to, to the NHL, you know, if you can, score in that league usually it translates to the nhl i went in there i was in a tough spot Uh, danny greer was a first round nhl player uh very good player um he got everything that he he deserved everything that he was given but yeah he was the first line centerman we had uh, chad kilger was on that team he was a fourth overall player they had a veteran that had uh, rob murray had played like 15 years pro or something like this he was the third line center like i just had for the first time, like, it's like where you're looking at a depth chart and you're like, where do I fit? You know, I'm a decent player. I, the coach liked me. I was an honest player, but there was no room for me. Like I was just kind of treading walk, trying to find a way to stay in the lineup at that level in the American League. I was a healthy scratch a few games. I think I played 75 games that year out of 80, but still five times I was healthy scratch. Uh, which had never happened to me before. My first year pro, I didn't score for 20 games. Wow. Probably the hardest time in my hockey career. Like I was, you know, alone in Springfield, Mass, and I hadn't scored for the first 20 games. And anyone that's been through a slump and played hockey at high levels, like some, you feel like you might never score. You know what I mean? And it felt like I might literally never score a professional goal, you know? And Finally, I got one in my 21st game. I think I had five assists at the time. And all of a sudden, I got six points in 21 games, the one goal. And I got better as the year went on. But it was a tough year, and it, it taught me a lot. But I just kind of had to put my head down and just continue to work. And, you know, I didn't salt. I was not a powder. I, I just came, uh, you know, and just kind of put the work boots on and, and just grinded through it. But that, that was a challenging year for sure. Yeah, what is the message there? I mean, like, that's interesting how you even painted that. I mean, you leave, you leave June, you're feeling like, hey, I had a chance at the Coyotes, right? Like, I mean, and rightfully so, right? You're feeling good about yourself. You're walking on cloud nine. You don't make that team. And we didn't get into how camp went, but neither here nor there. You go to Springfield. Now you're fighting to even get in the lineup. So, like, you, what you thought was this close now feels like a million miles away. You might never score a goal. Like, confidence dips at pro level is, is, is crazy. And I talk about confidence a lot with the guys that I work with. But, like, 
how did you how did you deal with that? Like, how did you deal with that and still keep that goal in mind that hey, I want to be an NHLer, you know, like I, I and I can be an NHLer. Like the belief of that when you even scored in twenty games at the American League level, I'm sure you're not telling yourself and you go to bed at night, I'm going to play six hundred games uh, in the NHL starting in the season, right? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I think thinking back, I, I think what my mindset was was finding a way to contribute just there. I think when I was going through that, I think the NHL thing wasn't, it was maybe more of a dream rather than a goal because at that point I was fighting for my life with the Springfield Falcons. You know what I mean? I was trying to find a place there and find a way to contribute and, you know, get in the lineup there. So I think maybe that focus of kept me kind of present and, kind of in it every day and I wasn't necessarily even thinking about Phoenix in those days. I yeah. was just trying to find my place on that team and but there were certainly some dark days, you know. So much value from that story. You know, Trevor went twenty games being a healthy scratch, not scoring any goals. Having this, he said it wasn't even a dream anymore. It was more of a dream than a goal, I should say, of playing in the NHL. He's one step away. He's one phone call away from being in the NHL. All he was focused on was trying to be the best that he could be where he was for the Springfield Falcons. That is such a great lesson. He wasn't calling his agent and asking for a trade. He wasn't complaining. He didn't mope, come moping into the rink. He showed up and he tried to do the best job that he could. And in doing that, not only did he prove to the coach and the organization that he was willing to roll his sleeves up and do things that are hard, but guess what? He also was able to prove to himself that he can get through things like that. He had the character to be able to overcome 20 games without a goal and to be over, overcome being a healthy scratch and not getting much ice time when he was out there. And from that lesson to himself, he gained some self-belief. He gained some confidence. He earned his confidence. And he ended up having a 700-game NHL career. That experience could have buried him. And it buried a lot of people. I've seen it happen. I'm sure he's seen it happen before. Just know that whatever it is you're going through, at whatever time, usually the hard stuff is the good stuff. Because that's going to have you come out on the other side a little shinier. If you choose that path, right? Don't let it ruin you. Let it define you, right? Let it be something that you grow from. So Trevor, that was an amazing story. Thanks so much for Trevor to come on. Uh, currently the Windsor uh, Spitfires head coach. And I know he's going to have his name on, his, on an NHL job here one, someday soon. So that wraps up episode one of the best of Up My Hockey so far. Uh, great lineup of guests. Uh, so many great lessons. I encourage you guys to listen to them all if you haven't listened to them. Um, super great stories. And I really appreciate all the feedback. I really appreciate everyone showing up uh you know to share with me what your experiences are and and what value you're getting from this from text message to direct messages to comments on social media uh a lot of people are listening a lot of people are getting value so thank you so much for continuing to supply me with the motivation to move forward and to keep doing this thing uh called up my hockey and to continue to share these messages and please keep the uh, reviews rolling in i know i've said this before uh, that it really helps the podcast. It really helps my motivation. It really helps my competitive nature in uh, having this podcast move up the ranks. So keep them coming. I will continue to read out the uh, the the reviews, the five star reviews on iTunes. And uh, until next time, play hard and keep your head up.